So it looks like we got a small bunch today for this afternoon's final setting of things and making of one last setting. Um, so maybe folks will join us later, but maybe not. I don't know. But what it means for you all is that you get the first chance to sign up for our next session. Get some info up for you guys. Where's the chat? So um, this session, and then we'll have a casual hangout and look at projects and see what people want to do and merry holidays and happy New Year's and things like that in December, um, because we're going to finish these last two settings, setting of these last two settings we did, and we're going to finish a card cut um, uh, for faceted stones today if everything goes according to plan. But meanwhile, um, here is a link, if my machine will behave, here's a link to register for next year's activity, which is just a new Zoom link, and that's the Revitalize, Redesign, and Repurpose, the box of unfinished projects. So that's what we'll move into uh, in January, if people are interested. I'm going to send out an email to the whole group that signed up for this one saying, hey, um, you've been getting messages from me for two years. If you want to keep getting them, here's the next project. <laughs> but otherwise, you got to sign up separately for it. Um, I this think weekend, I signed up already. You can't have signed up for that Today. one. Today. Okay, because it wasn't taking the passcode or I don't know. Is the password going to be the same? And it should numbers, be, but it's a different. Uh, it, it, it's a different link, so you need to register for it as a separate se series. Because um, okay. I, I clearly don't have 166 people attending these, which is what I've been sending out messages to about the the Cogswell program. Um, so this is really going to be a fresh start for the smaller group that wants to continue on with the next adventure. Um, so that link in chat will get you there. And I'll also send that out in a final, hey, we're wrapping up email. Um, as usual, we've got all of the places you can go to see me, to get on my mailing list, to see the YouTube, the Instagram, the Facebooks, all of those things. Um, that's that link. And then um, this weekend, there's still room in my clasps class, if anybody has last minute desires to join the uh, clasps from Simple to Structural, that's this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we're starting to get a little bit full in the hollow forms down in California. So if you are interested in going down to the Long Beach area in March, which to me seems like a lovely way to start off a spring is to go to California when it's still cold and miserable in, in Portland. Um, then you can sign up for the Hollow Forms workshop, which I'm going to put the link to if my computer will behave. Um, and that'll get you to the information for registering for uh, that class at Diane Weimer's studio down in Long Beach. Um, and as always, you can use my Rio for Schools, R-F-S-M-O-R-R, -R -R, and claim yourself as one of my students. Um, and that will get you six months of wholesale pricing if you don't already have another teacher providing that for you. Um, they ask that you register with as many teachers as give you codes because then they know who's actually participating in their programming. So let's see. Any questions before I get us started on the first part of Cut Card? And then we're going to go back and set our Trillion and Emerald Cut and then finish the cut card because we need to let the glue dry at one point in the cut card stuff. Question? How have your shows been coming along? Say that again? How have your shows, how have your shows been coming along? You've been it, busy. It, I've been busy, but it's been a weirdly awful year for a lot of us artists at the show scene. Um, really low sales for a lot of us. My sales have been all over the map in terms of price points of what people are buying. So there's not really like patterns that I can follow. Um, it was mm -hmm. a fun show to do this last one. Um, and it was lovely. And uh, the, I got a great video promoting me out of it. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but um, it's a really cool yes. eight, eight minute video. 
um, up on YouTube and on my, you can see it on my website. I've got a link to it on the bottom of my website. Um, but uh, so wonderful group of people and a really beautiful show. Um, not, uh, not enough sales for me, but that's been the theme of the year for me and for lots of others. If I was the only one not having lots of sales, I'd probably be jumping off a cliff, but um, instead I'm just trying to get some perspective on the year and think about what I want to do for next year. So I don't know is the answer. I don't know how shows have been going. <laughs> um, any other, any other technical questions? Or it's a hard you one. You, you, you work so hard. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into those and I do Just enjoy doing shows. I saw how fabulous your both look. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about where that is. It's still a little too much to travel easily with. So I've got to come up with a skimmed down version of it that still looks equally good. Um, but uh, I really liked how it looked this, this weekend. The, I like the new hard signage that I got with the model shots. Um, and I think I'm trimming my layout down to about the right amount of stuff. I'm still a little more on the display than I should have at any one point in time. But that, I think, will be a perpetual fight for me, um, just because of how many collections I have. Um, yeah, and, you know, all of the pieces that I had out were definitely things people were looking at. So it's one of those, you learn as you go, and then you got to keep learning because it's, it's an evolving market. And there's so many other things that influence sales at any given point in time. Um, there have been a lot of big corporate layoffs. There have been... You know, people are worried about the economy. People are worried about the uh, elections. There's any number of things that influences it. Um, and one of the best things I can say about this last weekend's show is that they had more foot traffic than I had seen there in years. So there's definitely people wanting to be out and about. Um, it's just I think people are nervous to spend on what sometimes are considered frivolous things. <laughs> buying buying treats for yourself that sparkle is not always a high priority compared to other things. So. But things for best. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a fan of buying things for yourself when you're in a rough spot. Otherwise, if you can, but I understand it. Um, any any other jewelry related or technical questions before I jump in? We are going to be on page one nineteen again for this one. One eighteen, I guess. Okay. Any other any other questions though? Okay, let's do this thing. I gotta raise my chair up though. I managed to shrink my chair down yesterday. I'm too short for my bench. I'm still getting used to the new wheels. Okay, so when we are looking at a faceted stone setting in the cut card setting, um, this is another one of those, it's really wise to use, oh, my camera is way far away from me. Let me get in closer for you guys. It's really wise to use a um, well-cut stone that is equal all the way around. So I would start, while you can do this with other shapes and sizes, I would start with a round or a square that is equal on all sides. Um, because it's going to make your laying out of things a lot easier. John does talk in the book about doing things that are more than just the crosshatch that we're going to be doing. So we're going to do the X like we did on the um, cabochon, but except we're going to do it with this faceted stone. Um, but he talks about how on an oval or something, you could put multiple pieces. It's just a little bit trickier to lay out when you've got one long piece and then two side pieces. And he's even got a nice drawing of it at the bottom of... Uh, 118 on the right of an emerald cut in a multi-part uh, setup. Uh, I think if the, the one that I would say is probably trickiest is if you decide you want to do a trillion or something in a cut card, then you've got to work your angles a little differently than you would. So you're not going 90 degrees to each other. You may have to do some kind of partial rotation so that your points come between the various slots. Um, but again, start out with something simple. I'm going to start out with just a perfectly well-cut six millimeter. Um, this has got to be a uh, cubic zirconia. It's from my, it's what I use for when I'm teaching basic stone setting. 
Um, and per John, we're gonna he likes to use 18 gauge um, for this, although he says you can go lighter, especially if your stones are smaller, or you can go higher if you need to for larger stones. Uh, but 18 gauge, so, so he says 20 gauge or larger to provide the structural and visual strength, because that is a big part of this is even though you may not need the thickness to support the stone, you need enough thickness for this to really have impact as a cross section. And so he generally uses the 18, bigger stones he'll go up from there. Um, and what we need to do to start is measure our dimensions and design the look that we're going for. So I did some really ugly sketching earlier of what I'm aiming for, but I'm gonna put down our measurements for this one. So getting your calipers zeroed in and measuring across the diameter. We come in, unless it's changed, we come in at six. So we're gonna go with six millimeter diameter. And you wanna know the table to Coulette height as well, because that's gonna be about the height of your gaps. And in this case, I am at 3.61. Able to Coulette. So that height, is what I need to account for here, right? I need to have enough room that my, oops, I'm not in screen. Let me go a little bit. I'm gonna rotate my camera a bit. So apologies in advance for the wobbly it's gonna get for a moment. It's not very well positioned for the angle I want you guys to see. Go. Okay, so the this is here to here important right and this is here to here important because we need our stone to be able to slot right down in and then the cutaway needs to make room so that we're not banging the tip of the stone against the base i'm going to get some of this blue out just so you guys can see that a little bit better let's just try to do the 3d thing so if this is our stone here we need room beneath it enough that it's not a huge ugly gap, but enough that it also um, doesn't bump the tip and that we have the zigzag here that creates the seating for the stone ultimately. And then we're gonna have a cross section of the same shape coming across to support it under here, and coming up here to create that other point. This is a very hard 3D to draw, right? So we're gonna have the facing us and then there's another point on the other side over there. So once we know these measurements, we can start to do our layout. And that starts with creating a folded piece of the 18 gauge that works with our stone. So, you can do it one of two ways. If, if you can broadly give yourself the measurements, you can just make a piece that is rectangular, that's wide enough, and then some. Um, or you can do a layout on graph paper, which is what I prefer in something this specific. So you get a fresh scrap of graph paper because that's kind of silly. So laying it out, I like the graph paper that comes with a, um, a center line because then I know that my six millimeter, oops, that's all dusty, hang on a sec. I know that my six millimeter equals three millimeters on either side of the line. So I'm gonna get my gauge set to three exactly, maybe if my gauge behaves.
I wish there was a nice, easy way to set these exactly. I need one that's so mechanical that I can put it, type in the number and then hit go and it'll rotate its gap to the right width. That's what I want. Oh, geez. Of tightening it, moved it. There we go. Okay, so I, what I'll do is I'll choose a center line, and then I'm going to measure three on either side of that center line on one of the cross pieces. And I'll do that in a couple spots so that I can make a line with my square. Two points of intersection to give me my nice lines. And what that gives me is my width of the um, stone. So that if I were to hold this stone in place here, it should go wall to wall on that, which it pretty much does. Um, but that would be, the stone would fall all the way through. So I'm going to need to design in a little bit of an angle down, and then the curve that I want that's gonna be where the stone coulette fits, right? So that's my baseline, and I need enough height that the stone will rest in there, but not be poking the bottom. And then whatever's below that is what's gonna create my foundation that the stone is gonna, that, that the setting is gonna rest on. So I'm gonna create something along those lines, giving myself where my stone is going to hit I can rough in the design of the stone, but now that I've got that cross measurement, now I can design what shape I want my outer visual to look like. So what I've done this time is something, oops, that's a little too high. Get this extra out of here. What I've done this time is I've said, I wanna have a little bit of a cutback and then I wanna go at an angle. So something along those lines for my shape. But I could do curves. I could, you can see that John does a lot of ones where he does this kind of cut back little legs kind of thing for it. So he does some of these kinds of shapes. Where it's got a nice undercut and some cut back. And he's just doing that kind of a shape. That's a really mangled version of a shape, but um, you can do arches. As long as you have that center component, which is where the stone is going to rest, right? And as long as they will look good when they're opposing each other and that you have a surface at the bottom, I don't think you ever really want to come to a tight point on these because you need some surface that you're going to solder down, whether it's to your ring or to a necklace, even if it's sort of standalone, or you're going to need to post this, which is what you'll see done in a lot of the Tiffany style pieces where there's a post put in and then in the ring, this is often done in a platinum and it's set into a gold ring or something like that. And so there's a hole drilled and then that's the solder point through the ring where it's posted down to it. But you need some surface area right where the two pieces meet at the bottom in order to connect it to whatever you're attaching it to. Um, and besides, if you made it pokey, it would poke whatever's behind it, which will be either the body or the ear or something like that. So I've got this rough shape, and what I prefer to do is a paper doll style thing. So I'm going to line up my center line, because as much as I sketch it, I'm not going to get a great shape that's equal on both sides by drawing. What I need is to get my shape cut out, so I'm going to give myself a little extra material in case I want to play around with it. Right. So I've got my center line, I've got it paper doll folded, and the important lines for me are 
that width apart, which is the width of the stone, making sure I'm cutting down my lines on that. And then where it starts to zigzag out, so I'm going to show you this in stages. So right now, I've cut down so that I've got the six millimeter gap, and then I've cut the angle that the stone is going to rest on. Now when I fold it back up, I'm going to take out that middle U to give a space for the Colette to hang out. And I can always rough check it to see, is my stone going to sit nicely there? So this one's a little bit deeper of a, of a U than I needed. But you can decide visually what you want it to look like. There's Sometimes there's something cool about that, to have air beneath it. It's sort of floating there. Um, and then I'm going to design my outer shape a little more tightly. So I'm going to cut in. Remember, I don't need too much poking out above because I'm going to be folding that down over the stone. So I want to make it just high enough of a point or I'm going to have to slice down some of the material in order to fold it down as if it were a prom. So now we're getting into something kind of interesting to me. Is that showing okay to you guys or do I need to zoom in? Yeah, can you zoom zoom in? Yep. Ooh, my light is also doing a lot of reflection. Let me put this on a different backdrop because it'll show better on black, I suspect. There we go. So here's our cut out we just did. All right, guys, everything is out of whack today. There's our little cutout. Let's see if I can face it to the camera. And you'll see okay. that when I put that stone yeah, in there, better. right? Okay. Let's uh -huh. see if I can hold it up and still show you without getting in the way. So I'm designing the shape of the half. Okay, that's what I was getting ready to say. You're gonna do two identicals, right? Right. Right. So that's okay. that's where I'm headed for a design. I'll see which one I like yeah. better of the two that I've cut out today. I think I like this trimmed one a little bit better. It's a little tighter. So I'm going to go with this one that I cut earlier. It has a better proportion to where the stone is going to sit. Um, and so that's going to be my template, but we're going to lay that out after we've gotten our prepped material, wrong way, after we've gotten our 18 gauge prepped material, but I needed at least a template of how wide I was gonna go and how tall it was gonna need to be to make sure I have a piece of metal that's got enough room for it. So now I've got that roughed in, I can say, yes, I can in fact do my fold line somewhere right about here, right? And I'm gonna square that up on a piece of well, squared material. Uh, this end is going to be cut off, but um, so I know that I squared this up earlier. Um, so I'm going to use my uh, square and score the line that I'm going to be folding on. And unlike things that we do, like when we're doing the insides of um, uh, the emerald cut and so on, we're not actually going to be folding in on the cut. We're going to be folding out on the cut. So there's my score mark, and then I'm going to do a saw down that about two thirds of the way through. And what's gonna be happening with this is it's gonna hold the two pieces folded together straight into place. And our mission on this one is to make a perfectly matched pair of rectangles that all they have in common is that tiny little seam line that we're cutting down to. As with any of this straight line cutting, where we're trying to do a fold across it, I'm going to flip every once in a while. Try and get a more consistent depth. I'm looking for about two thirds of the way through, maybe a little less, if anything. You just have to have enough that you can do the fold line. And I'm going to grab my parallel jaw pliers. And in this case, I'm gripping to one side of the line and then I'm pushing 
the material away, right? If it snaps, you cut too far into your material. And otherwise, we're just going to tap it down gently, fold it down, and then tap it down to get it as close fitting as we can. And I've got a little bit of excess hanging over, which I'm going to trim away. Because again, we want to start this project with good, clean, squared up material. I'm just following the square line of the other half to trim it up. Okay, so what I've got now is a sandwich of two pieces back to back. That's the line I just cut down into it. And that's the back of that line where I didn't cut underneath there, right? Um, I may even do a little hammering with something a little more consequential just to make sure it's really, really flush. And make sure that it's flush all directions too. If you cut a little squiggly, you might be able to cheat it back square by hitting the sides down to line that up. My sides are looking pretty good. My base just needs a little bit of cleaning up. So I'm gonna take it to a large flat file. I can figure out where I put down my large flat file earlier. Oh, it's right in front of me. So I'm just cleaning it up until I have decently squared up all the way around. Let's check that. Eh, I'm a little bit off, so I got to take a little more off on the edge. You can be fairly aggressive about this as long as you've left yourself enough material. Mark this out because I'm not liking how sloppy that line looks. Okay, so I got a little bit of extra filing to do. And on this, I'm just emphasizing the end that's a little wonky. And then I'll put that the whole surface. The more square you start, the happier you'll be with your output when you're done. That's much better. Okay, so I've now got this little well-formed, well-edged, squared up package. And I'm gonna wanna pry it open a little bit and put some glue in there. He recommends a fast acting cyanocrylicate. I can, I'm not pronouncing that right. Cyano Acrylate, wait a minute, where's the word? Uh, mirror images, fold is a perfect rectangle. Uh, I know he's mentioned what he likes in doing this somewhere on page 119. I'm just not finding it. Um, cyanoacrylate, that's the word. So I'm using one that he recommends usually, which is just a super glue. Um, but there are plenty of others out there. You just want to be careful not to glue your fingers to it or anything back and forth. I'm not going to glue this one because I needed enough time for it to dry. So I did create a glued piece earlier before I started today. 
Um, but all I do is I just took a little dead saw blade piece and dipped it in the a little bit of the glue and then um, closed it down and made sure it was a snug, snug closed fit. You want if you need to or you have a hydraulic press, put it in the press before you do the gluing, and then that'll ensure that you've got a nice flat surface. But that we're going to leave that one to rest to finish drying. Any questions about that process so far? No. You're just drying it so that they can both be the same cut? Yeah, so that's helping us cut. We're going to cut them as a pair as part of this. So you get exact mirrors of okay. each other. Um, so that's not true. We get, okay. we're going to cut most of the cuts as the connected exact mirror. And then the last step is making the slots for fitting them together. And those are done separately so that we don't cut two top slots. We need a bottom slot and a top slot so they fit together, right? Right. That makes sense. Um, okay. Okay. Let me think about. Yeah. I'm looking want. at the picture. So. Oh yeah. There's great step-by-step -step on this one. Um, okay. So then, then while we're waiting yeah. for that to dry a little mm -hmm. bit longer, I would like to set one of our settings from the prior sessions. So we have two to set today. We have our beloved emerald cut, which has a whole lot of wax on it right now. I should have cleaned this up. Um, and our trillion that we did a few sessions back. So I'm going to start with the trillion. So we remember some of our basic principles of what we do with corners. And then we will do the other one. Where is my paper towels? There we go. So I'm going to clean this up with a little rubbing alcohol. I've done all my polishing and sanding, et cetera, et cetera, before I even get started on this. I just need to make sure that I have no gunk on the stone at this point. So we have a nice little setting. Right? And in this particular case, I think my stone is not a perfectly equal trillion. So I have to find the corner that belongs with the right corner in order to get where I need to go. One direction fit better than the others. There we go. Looks like that's it. And it looks like in the course of polishing, I managed to distort one wall a little bit. So I'm just gonna gently, gently push that back in a little bit more, a little less curve than it has on it right now. So I should mark the corner once I discover which one it fits. That one. Okay. Obviously, you would have this soldered down to whatever you're going to attach it to before you do all this. Um, in this case, I'm setting a nice little lemon quartz with a... Um, called cushion top. I can't remember the name for it when it's got a funny facet layer on the top. Still have a little bit of distortion on that top. So if I do something a little more aggressive. I'm just squeezing a little bit. I'll have to repolish. I should have caught this before I did final polish. Makes me a little happier. All right, so this is a very snug fit on this stone, such that it's not likely to actually sit down well until I've done my corner cuts and done a little cleanup inside. And what I like for the cleanup inside is a barrel burr. Um, and in particular, I'm really loving these bush finishing burrs, cylinder burrs. Get my goggles though, because it's going to be little bits that are flying. 
And um, especially if you get a little sloppy with your solder on the inside, um, doing a little bit of cleanup with this just above the seat of the stone, all I'm doing is taking some material out to the line of the, of the seat. And these br little burrs, a little wax, but they, um, they do a really nice job of just cleaning up every little bit of solder and inconsistent material. Just gotta be careful not to cut through. It's very easy to go too far. Doing a very light touch, just a back and forth to try and get things a little evened out in this one corner that's a little knobby. Get that a little cleaner. Starting corner. Oh man, I managed to mark. remove the mark. Mark on the inside this time too. Don't wipe it away. Okay. So um, once I've got uh, the clean fit, then I'm going to switch over to a ball burr. If I can figure out where I left my ball burrs. Guys, 24 hours ago, my studio was about as messy as it's been the, all year because I had such chaos from getting ready for the shows. Um, and then I came in and swept through and cleaned like crazy for you guys. And because I've got class this weekend, I, I can imagine starting a class. Pardon? What was that? Somebody else agreeing that they have messy studios? I said, I could only imagine. <laughs> I said, I could only. Yeah. yeah. Um, I must be on a little bit of a delay because I'm hearing you guys after. Yeah. Uh, so I'm taking a ball burn. I'm... Carmen, did you have I more? Have oh, I understand when you have a show that what a mess it can be. Yeah. Um. And I was trying to get some earrings done before the event. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting only into the corners with my ball burr. And I am going down a little bit into the seat as well as into the upper wall. I'll show you what I mean by that in just a sec. I'm going to do a first pass and see how this looks. Because what we're doing here is giving a protective gap, an air gap, for where the points of the stone are going to rest. So that once we're pushing down, we don't have a pressure point at the corners that snaps the stone. I'm going to put a little dot in the divot so that you can hopefully see it a little better. Zoom in for you guys once I can see again. So you see the black dot yep. in that corner? That is how much I burred away. So that's the divot on each mm -hmm. corner that I'm creating. I need enough of a pocket that when I push down over this, I, I don't put pressure on the corners of the stone. So that little black dot right there. And I used a fairly good sized ball burr for this. This is a... Looks like it's a 0.8, almost a 0.9, 0.88 uh, ball burr. So it's going to depend, obviously, on the size of what you're working on, but it's not a, not just a tiny little divot. And now I want to see if that leaves me enough space for this to comfortably rest. It may not be enough yet, or it may be just enough. And what we need is for our stone to set down on the table so, and not have right. pressure points. Oops, sorry, too zoomed. So I'm checking to see what the fit is like on this. 
And if it's resting down on um, the... I don't see you anymore. You don't see me? Mm -hmm. Do other people? I see your hands in the thing. Yeah, um, I see. Yeah. Now I do. Okay. Uh, I have a question about... Okay. For like... When you when you did the little um divot with the the drill, yeah, um, don't you have three points? I did. I did all three. I only marked one of them. Yeah, I did the same level of ball burr to each one. I just only put sharpie in that one corner. Okay. It was just to make it show to you guys. Oh, okay, okay. I wasn't sh I'm, okay. I so what I've got is I'm happy with how it's fitting in two of the corners, but the corner that had the sort of distorted shape is not surprisingly giving me a little grief still. Um, and it, so it's not quite low enough resting on the edge. And one of the things I want to point out, I'm going to actually draw on my stone for you guys too, and then zoom back in. Because one of the things I want to point out about the shape of this stone because it, it will make a difference depending on the type of stone you've got and the quality of the cut is just how much thicker it is at the corners than at the top i mean then at the center of each side so i'm gonna trace that edge for you and then show you the Good angle for you guys. Okay, come back here. Um, so what I'm trying to point out to you all, and I'm trying to get the right angle to make it actually make sense for you. There's a good angle. If you look at, what am I going? If you look at the tips, God, guys, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job of positioning this. If you look at the corner points, you'll see that it appears uh, considerably thicker than right in the middle of each. Let's see if I can do this without my fingers in the way. So here and here, it's thicker than right in the center, right? But we built a wall that was flush all the way across, right? It doesn't have any dips. So depending on your stone, you may have to account for that and do a little cutting away. And our ball burr did a little bit of cutting away right at each corner, but I need to widen that out a little bit more to account for the excess thickness at the corners. And I'm going to draw this large scale on the board too, because it'll make a little more sense if I do that. So my stone presently has this happening, right? It's got thicker here and here than it does here. Oh, I'm not in screen for you guys, sorry. Let me draw that all over again. Rawr. So my stone has this kind of a curve at the top with the facets coming up triangular facets. Okay. So this is all cushion cut, whatever it is. And then here it does this, where it will be resting on the seat. I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but you'll see that this and this are wider than this, right? But we built a wall that essentially does that. Okay. So we, by ball burring it away a little bit, I get a little bit of leeway for that. So I get it's kind of a dip here, which helps. But right now, it's not proving enough for this particular stone's width. So what I need to do is take my gap and spread it further out so that I'm getting a curve that comes closer to following the resting of the stone. Doesn't have to be perfect because we still want air gapping at each corner. But I do need to make this work a little bit more to my uh, stone shape. Questions about that? Does that make sense? 
Makes sense. Carmen, I saw a hand up, I think. <laughs> um. Carmen, I think you might be having this was starting to confuse me, but you need you need more of an explanation on that? So we've built a setting that basically has this in it, right? It's got this um, little, little wall, right? But our wall we built out of flat sheet. So it's all at one level, whereas our curve does this on the stone. So right now we are here and we need to have something that goes more like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm exaggerating the curve on this particular stone just so you can see it. But what that means is mm -hmm. I have this already locked in place at the flat line. So my only way to get that curve is to start taking material away until it becomes dipped enough at the corners that I can curve it. So what's, what's happening that is too close up for you guys to see is that my stone is not low enough on the setting for me to get enough material over because it's sort of resting on its points and I need it resting further down. I need it resting somewhere up here. Does that make more sense, Carmen? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Right. So that's solvable. It just means more with the drill. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to try starting with a bigger ball burr, um, and then I may have to go back and forth between the ball burr and the. Um, the cylinder burr, so the barrel burr, called both cylinder and barrel. Um, but let me start with a larger ball burr first. Can find a good size one. Yeah, I'm gonna move up to the biggest one that I have right now. Setting go. Right, so I got to be careful again not to go far through the material because I've done that in the past. So I'm still going to be controlled. But my goal at this point is to take more down on the step than on the back wall, on the upper wall. So I'm just digging that in a little further. Down into the corners. So why am I doing this one before I do the um, emerald cut? It's in part because this only has three corners to deal with and the emerald cut has eight. So once we get this routine down, the same principle is gonna apply to that. It's just a little more subtle because it doesn't have curvature. It mostly just has the points. Um, and I'm gonna do a little more cleanup with my cylinder burr. That last one that was a little choppy. And Bush also makes finishing burrs that are ball burrs. And I'm going to pull down that set because what I'd like to do is have a little more control. Um, the coarseness of the regular ball burr set is a little too much for me. So bear with me while I go grabbing a finer set of burrs. Or I might find my flame burrs. That's what I hand grab first. So I'm going to go with the flame burr. Flame, also known as a bud burr, is one of those things that there's not a lot of people using them, um, but boy, they're a handy, handy shape. It literally looks like a candle flame. And so I'm going to actually use my, it, it sort of got, has a little bit of the best of both worlds of the cylinder burr and the um, uh, 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 round burr. And so when I need to get down into this corner and sort of control the shaping that I'm doing, I'm just going to see if this is going to be a better fit to get me that adjustment that I'm trying for in the corners. And it definitely is. I'm just doing a very tiny little gentle scrape at the corners, trying to be very careful not to take too much away because I still need supporting wall for the stone. 
So I'm really focusing on trying to sort of carve and shape that inner step to meet the curvature that we were just drawing. Let's see how that's doing for setting the stone. Where's my mark? Mark. Okay, we're getting much closer. I'm getting a good fit on two of my corners. I've just got one corner that's not low enough yet for my tastes. It's the angle. No, nope, this definitely needs to take a little more, maybe off of those, those corners. So again, I'm just working into that spot that I already did a round burr into. I'm taking the corners out and down into a curve. And then I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna switch back to my cylinder burr just to get a little bit of cleanup following the line that I've created with the flame, with the, with the bud burr. So I'd love to tell you a perfect combination of burrs that will do exactly what you need every time. But the challenge is it's dependent on the shapes and the needs of the stone and of the setting. Why we hold on to a whole bunch of different burrs. Really good now. Let's see if I go low enough. In that one corner. First. So we're squeaking by. I have this one area on this corner that's not setting nicely low. And so now I start to do a little evaluation of whether it's actually just the corner that is holding it up. What I suspect is that there's a little bit of material right about here that it's catching on. Because it's not that it doesn't want to go down. Well, maybe it is both that. It's that that the corner and all the way over. So I'm going to focus my work on this area from about here over to get it to set. Because this corner is setting beautifully. This corner is setting beautifully. So there's probably something that it's pivoting on partway along one of these walls. And this is a, a, just going to be a back and forth of the various burrs. So I'm going back to my bud burr to dig a little bit more into that corner. And then I'll clean it up with the flame burr. where that chunk of material needed to come off. Switching to the flame burr, oh, not the flame burr. And then cleaning up a little bit further with the cylinder or barrel burr. I think the difference between cylinder burr and barrel burr might be the granularity Cylinder burr is a little finer, I think. And a barrel burr is supposed to take a lot of material off at a time, but I could be making that up. I don't know. If anybody out there knows, pipe up. Okay, so now that took a lot more away. Let's see how we're doing. I think when the... The burrs are fresh. They take a lot of material. Yeah. Yeah. Before you clog them up with stuff. Oh, much sweeter. There we go. Now, is that enough? 
not quite, but it's massively improved. And I think I may need to look at the other side instead now that I've gotten that corner down. So I've got a little bit of lift on this side, which means I want to take some material away right over here, leading into that side so that this has a little more room to rest. And I think this is probably just a little more clean up with the barrel burr because I can see the little lump that's in the way. So this is a very light touch use of the burr. I'm barely brushing across it. And you'll when I when I get done with this cleanup, what I'm going to do is I'm going to black in all of the area that I've carved away. So you'll see just how extreme a change it is to the inside line for this particular stone. Again, it's going to really depend on which stone you get as to how far you need to go with it. I'm still not happy with this one side, so I'm going to take a little more down on the whole side wall here. I feel like maybe this side of the stone is a little bit uh, more broad than the other two sides. So I'm trying to take care to, when I trim down, I'm trying to take care to keep my seat intact or at least follow the shaping of it. Okay, we are at a point where I could probably get away with setting the stone with this little material over the top, but it's not going to be a terribly consequential cleanup. I mean, uh, over the top, it's not going to be a very obvious set. So it's a little bit, a little bit light. Bear with me while I drop everything. Uh, where are my glasses? Not a day in the studio without dropping the stuff you're working on. Yeah, I still want this a little lower in the set than it is, because um, otherwise it is likely to come loose over time.
And I could have avoided a little bit of this process by making a taller exterior wall. I was keeping it pretty tight on this one. Um, but no matter what, I was still going to have some of the cutaway that I have to do because of the curvature of this stone. So what I'm getting is about a fingernails gap between the top of the stone and the wall. And that's just a little shy of comfort for me because it's a tight fingernails gap. So I'm gonna keep working at this a little bit longer. I think we've got it now. Okay, so lots and lots of cleanup on this one. Sometimes your setting is comfortable as is when you just put the ball burr corners in. Um, sometimes you need to do that level of work on it. I'm going to um, paint up just how much I carved away so you guys can see how much dip it has now at those points. I have a question. Yeah. Somebody asking a question? I can barely hear you if you are. Oh, I think, Carmen, you might be having audio problems. Can anybody can anybody hear me? Am I talking to nobody? <laughs> I hear you. Okay. Can anybody else hear Carmen that I'm not hearing? I can hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay, Carmen, you're you very, Carmen? very faint on my system at least. Okay. I have 94 on my speakers. So uh oh. I, well, yeah, it's your microphone. So I think you may be losing connection a little was, bit. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me, but I I was wondering what the the difference would be or it's pretty much the same if you were doing gold or silver because right now you're doing silver and you also do gold would it be softer when you're doing the corners or harder so softer a little bit i use 18 karat gold when i'm setting um because i hate the look of 14 karat gold and i don't work in white gold um so yes, 18 karat is a little more, I would say, I would describe it as more buttery than silver. Um, but the essence of what we're doing is still the same. So this gets a little scratchy as I'm doing all of the cleanup. I think gold, I would have a cleaner result and I wouldn't have as much polish leftovers to do. Um, but I'd also be much more careful about every bit of dust that I'm gathering. Um, so I'd be, yeah, have stuff underneath specific for catching the gold dust and so on. Um, I can probably get in okay. closer than that even. Let's see. Wrong way. Focus for me. Nope, too close. Come on, focus. There we go. Okay, so you see how dipped down the corners are now? Yes. That's how much I gouged away. So only at the very, this, this is where my, my wall was, right in the middle. I didn't take much down at the, the top of each wall. So I had to, that, what I did first was the ball burrs in the corners to start those corners. And that wasn't enough for this particular stone. So then we went it back in with a combination of the ball burrs, the bud burrs, and the um, and the cylinder burrs. And my cylinder burr was mostly, once I have the divot from the ball burr and then go in and clean it with the flame, it's mostly making sure it stays crisp in the curve. So what I'm doing is running the, so uh, uh, one of these good finishing um, cylinder burrs has surface that cuts on the top of the burr as well as along the sides, which means it can really eat away 
Um, but what I'm doing is uh, in most of that, I was just running the top of the burr along the um, lip of my step and just following the curve that had been created by putting the bud burr and the ball burr in there, right? So it cleans up creating, retaining the sharpness of the seat that I need in all cases, right? If I just did that with a ball burr, it would be eating up the, the, flat, the flat lip that we're resting the stone on. Questions about that before we go into actually setting it? Okay, let me zoom back out. And I gotta clean this up from all that black mark that I've got on there. So give me a moment to get some alcohol on here and clean it out. We'll get this one set and then we'll go back to making the other setting. And we'll see if we get to setting our um, final stone or if we're gonna end up doing that as our December finish out with a bang and hopefully no cracked stone type bangs. Get more alcohol in here, and then low. Okay, again, after all this work, I would generally normally go back and do a little touch up polish, probably uh, do a little sanding and and maybe even tumble a piece again, because I've done a lot of eating at the edges of things. But for now, since it's a practice stone, just clean it up a little bit. Of course, I now have forgotten which way it's supposed to go. I gotta find my proper points. Oh, first guy, is that the right one? That works best. Yep, first one was right. Okay, and if this were on a piece, I could put it into a good clamp and so on. If I if I had the time, I would put this into um, some stick stick stuff, you know, the Loctite or anything like that. But for now, we got a little piece of mat down. This is just a little bit of leather, and I'm going to find my favorite pusher. Where is my bezel pusher? There we go. Um, and so John, in a lot of cases does not actually say that the only way to do things is to do your corners first on his mark. I mean, on his emerald cut, he has a couple different variations on it, but on these, we really do want to hit corners a little bit first. So all I'm doing is gentle pushes in at each corner from both sides. And this isn't a finish set. This is just a first hold the stone in place push, making sure we got enough meat in the setting to actually hold it, because these corners are what is really going to hold it more than just anything else. It's got to be nice and snug there, okay? And do, does it help you guys if I pause and close up at each of the phases of this so you can see? Or is that enough? Are you able to see that I've done the corner pinches? Tell me, tell me when you need a zoom. Close up would be nice. A close up would be nice. Okay. Too close. So you can see I've just pushed in here, 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 here and here, here, right? So far, that's all I've done. I may be able to work, if I get this positioned right, I may be able to work in a spot you guys can see close up. Not that close probably, but closer. Uh, let's, let me see if I can work there. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be, I'm going to have to move things around if I'm going to do this. Let's see. I need to be closer to it than that. Let's see how that does. Okay, so now I've got my corners. I'm going to do the centers next, a little bit of a push at each center. 
And I'm doing in and up, but not all the way up at this stage, right? I'm just getting my initial pass at pushing in. And then I've now got corners and then sort of the ugly before it gets beautiful layer. Now I'm going to choose a side and really work that side all the way back down to the corners and then work another side. And this is where all of that hard work of putting in the ball burr space is going to do you in good stead. Because if I were doing this kind of pressure and I didn't have those corner spots, I'd be hearing cracking noises and chipping noises. And knock on wood, so far we're good. Okay, and I once I've remember. done an initial pass of... Sorry, say again? Diane? Somebody's asking me I something. I said, I can't but... remember when I did mine. I did not do any of that. I just put it in. Ah, you're lucky you didn't crack I'm this one. I'm having problems with the internet, sorry. That's okay. You're you're lucky you didn't crack the stone then, because um, that's this is all this is often the point at which it becomes problematic. It's even worse on an actual triangle over a trillion. Trillion has enough of a curve that it's a little more supported. Um, but yeah, they can both get kind of ugly, all right? And so now that I've got a good pass down, I'm going to go back and do more on the corners. And on corners, John has given us two different approaches to cleaning up the corners. There's the saw down and then push over method. And there's the file down and, and, and push over method. And I have a third that I use, um, which is pinching the corners tight and then filing down. And by pinching them, I mean, I'll take a pair of flat pliers, my flat pliers. I'll take a pair of flat pliers and literally squeeze across the top knowing that I'm making marks on it, but also knowing that I'm going to then take that material away. So I take a barrette file, take a little bit of it down once I've got the pinch. And once I've got it thinned, I watch out for not going too far with the filing before I push down again. And you can see I start to get that nicely closed, can't really see the seam layer on there. And I can do a little bit of touch up on that with the file. Got to be a little careful because we're getting close to the stone. And I'm probably going to need to do a little bit of follow up um, with a graver to clean up any bits and bobs. Um, so that's one approach is that that squeezing part. Um, the other is um, the, is using your um, bezel pusher and getting it as tight as you can and then filing and pushing and filing and pushing until they basically fold over on each other. So this one, I'm going to do that technique where I'm filing it before I've got it. I'm not pinching it the way I did on the last one. I'm just taking some of the material down. I'll start to see a seam in it. And when I start to see the seam in it, that's when I go and push down again. So I'm just starting to see the seam, but I've now thinned the material enough that I should be able to get a little bit more of a push. So it in, a, it in essence acts the same as what I just did on the first one um, where I'm pinching and, uh, and then filing. In this case, I'm filing and then pushing and then filing and then pushing to achieve a similar result. And if you've done this, Carefully enough and well, you won't actually see the seam by the time you're done with all your pushing. And I'm seeing that I need to go a little bit more on my edges because I'm getting ahead of them with the corners. Oop, careful, careful. Okay, and then the last one I'll do the sawing way, which you want to pull out a very, very fine saw blade for this one. So I'm going to go with, what have I got, a five aught, Ooh, a five aught. So I'm going to pick a five aught simply because I don't have anything thinner right now. 
But ideally you want one that's so fine you can barely see the teeth in it. And this is actually one of my least favorite ways. Per personally, I feel less in control of the material and the stone when I'm sawing towards it than when I'm filing to towards it. I don't know why. That's just my, my jam. So I'm just cutting straight down the corner, which is a little tricky to get started. Or a lot tricky to get started, depending. And I'm being very careful to stop as I get close to the stone, right? So I'm cutting as close to the stone as I'm comfortable doing. And then once I've done that cut, that makes room for the further push into the corners. And then I have to come back in once I've squeezed them together and cut down that same line again. I think the other thing is that I often feel like I've made my line go below where I have to when I'm doing one of the other techniques. I feel like I, the saw angle makes it cut in further than I want. And so I, it feels more visible to me by the time I'm done. Clean up a little bit of this wax that's getting in here. Push it over on this one side. Now, I tend these days to not do a whole lot of larger stones by hand. I tend to use my micro motor um, because my hand strength is diminished these days. Um, whatever tools work for you, whatever gets the job done. Um, all right, so we've got a fairly well set stone. You always want to check if there's any rattle in there. Um, it's a little inconsistent because of the curvature of the stone. So I will probably come back through with a graver and clean up and bright cut this upper edge. But before I do any of that, I'm going to take a burnisher to it to see if that takes care of some of my, of my issue. And again, I normally have this set in something that I can really grip it, but I'm just going to be running the burnisher along that top line. A lot to hold on to on this one right now. So you haven't had a problem when you use your micro My micro motor? No, I, my micro motor is uh, it's a hammer action. So um, once you learn how to control it, it's quite powerful and fast. And I have one of the ones that is pressure driven, so. If I lift off of the piece, it stops hammering. Okay, so we now have a rough set on that. Needs a little cleanup at the corners. All of the corners need a little filing. My least favorite is the one that I did the saw in because I can see the saw line. So let me see if I can get anything at all pushed beyond that. And then I'll zoom in and see if you guys can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Doesn't matter how often I do that, it goes the wrong direction. Okay, focus. Right, so we've got the setting and this corner, you can see that tiny, tiny little saw cut. So if you can get more control on how low you go with your cut than I do, Maybe you won't have that same issue, but I'm still gonna stick with one of my other two techniques that come across cleaner to me, which is either the pinch and file or the file and then push, either one, right? And we would take, once we're done with all the cleanup and bright cutting, we would, or even probably before the bright cutting, 
I would be taking a Swifty wheel. I've talked to you guys about Swifty wheels, the rubberized wheel to it, and cleaning up some of the marks on it all the way around the edges to get it nice and neat. Um, in this case, what's disturbing me is that one corner is a lower dip than the others. That's either the cut or the way that I dug down. I may have dug down a little farther than I realized on one corner. So this is what I would grave away, is that little bit of excess so that it looks more like the other two corners. I would even these corners out. And now that I say that, I realize that I like the saw cut crispness at the top. It's the outer edge that I'm not happy with. Whereas I like the effect of, I think this was my file and push corner. Um, no, sorry, that was my pinch and pinch and push corner. And this was my file and push corner. Um, so I like the cleanness of the cornering on the pinch version. I like the cleanness of the top view doing the saw version of it. Um, but that's su such a subtle thing and all of them, you're fixing one corner or the other with a little bit of cleanup. So that's that, questions? Not here. Okay. Bingo, bango. Um, let's go back to, let me clean a few of these tools up so that I don't have quite- Looks pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks yeah. for describing yeah. all Thanks for describing all three methods. I hadn't heard of the pinch one, so that was interesting. Yeah, the, so the pinch one, I will give you a heads up. It's going to put some serious scratch marks on the spot that you're pinching to either side of it. Um, but if you're working with thick enough material, um, then then it's you've got enough room to do that because you're you're gathering the material right at the corner. Yeah, um, and for me, it's it's a hand strength issue. I can do so much more with a pair of pliers than I can. And if you have a good solid pair of the plastic tipped pliers, you might get enough pinch. I find I need metal to do it. I need enough force. Um, but it's the same principle as the file down one. It's just starting tighter because the file down one, you've only got so much that you can push into the corner before you have to start filing. And the pinch just says, nope, we're, pu we're pushing it at the base of where it meets instead of from the up from above the force of the of the pusher can only get so sharply into your corner whereas a pinch is going to close right at that base um so they're achieving a similar end of pull the material as close together and then file off the top and then continue to close them over and and it should it's almost a slight fold over gang so um let me see if i can do that facing you guys so if we've got whether we're doing a cut or we're doing one of the other two methods, the pinch method or the file method, we get a gap that is hopefully not terribly big by the time we've paused, and then we're pushing it together. So it's sort of folding over each other. And then we're putting more pressure on it and we're getting put, so we're, we're filing more away. So it gets a little gap. And we're pushing it and we're pushing it and we're pushing it. So what we're doing is not the getting rid of the material that's getting like this, right? The weight of the material that's clogging because it's a double layer sandwich right there. And so any of the techniques are taking that material away so that it becomes just the barest foldover. And that tiny little bit of foldover is what hides our seams. And that's part of why I have challenges with that sawing one is because I can't fully hide my seam down at the bottom where the bottom of the cut is. Often I can't get enough pressure to set that at the corner. And the other two are, I'm going from the top of the point, so I never get down here at the corner fold. Um, but they're all acceptable approaches. Um, and it's sort of like Windows versus Mac on the, you know, cornering stuff. People have different opinions about what has to be the way. Uh, if it works and it looks good, you do you. Um, as long as you got that protective air gap in there, you're in good shape. Okay. Next up, we are going back to, I can get a few more things out of the way, or else I'm going to lose all my budbers. Those out of the way, those out of the way. All right, so we are going back to our hopefully mostly dry collection of uh, two folded over pieces. 
And we're going to do some layout work based on the template and careful measurements. So John recommends that once you've got your piece laid out, and we know where the top is, so here's my top. We're gonna um, take one side to be our template side and blacken it on up, except I'm not gonna have a decent marker. You know, markers should last longer than they do. They're supposed to be permanent markers. Um, so I'm just sharpening up one of the surfaces, letting that dry, and then we're gonna grid it out. And this grid, you know, gang, that I do not love measuring things, but on this particular setting, this grid is magical. You need to have your precision. You need to have everything exactly where it should be in order to get the mechanism to fit together as it should. So I'm gonna zero out my calipers. Am I on, oh, I'm on inches all of a sudden. Hang on a sec, millimeters again. And I'm going to get my total dimension and give myself half of that. So Yeah, somebody please invent for me a better device for measuring. Okay, and I'm just gonna put a center stripe line, which I like to do from both sides. And that gives me confidence that I have in fact found my center line. If I get a double line, it means I'm not measured correctly. And then now what are the other lines he wants us to lay out? He would like us to grid out our height that we want below the piece. And so I'm going to start with the measurement that I have here on this template that we made. I'm pretty happy with these proportions. And I'm going to strike that across from the bottom. And that is my baseline. And then the difference between this stripe and the next stripe up needs to be where I'm putting the, um, the seat, right? Make sure I'm doing that right. Yeah, so it's the difference in this case between the bottom of the table of the stone and the top of the table of the stone because I need to have enough height above that it has room to rest, but I don't need much more than that. This one's a little bit tricky to measure. And I'm gonna err on the side of caution because this is an area that I can file down if I need to. So that is from where I am. I'm just going to make a few marks and then I'll use my square. Try to make a few marks. Why are you not making marks for me? And I'm basing these marks off of the previous mark so that I'm in parallel to that. And square up. Line and those are one of those is not square. Bear with me. Starting line is not as square as it should have been. If you have to remark something, take little slashes and take little make little slash marks across the part you're supposed to ignore. 
So I just had to correct. There was a little bit of a not squared up angle on that first line that I had done across. Okay, so then I have my uh, grid that way. And now I need to know how wide I need to go for my stone, which is gonna be back to that three millimeters off center is the max that I want. And I'm gonna err in this case on the, on the side of caution um, and make it a little narrower, narrower so that I can always file away to wider if I need to. Cause I'd rather this be tight at the outset than um, too wide cause the stone won't sit well if I make it too wide. I'm going to go at like 2.7 or so because I need three point. I need a little bit of room on each side. And I'm doing that off of the center line as well. them down from the center and from the top and the bottom and I use my square again to give myself those extra lines all the way up. Ew, that does not look equal. Bear with me. Okay, I'm going to blacken this again and then highlight the lines that we care about just to make them a little more visible. So the more precise that you can make this, the happier you'll be with your cuts and with your fit at that magical final putting the cards together step. Okay, so I'm trying to see if that's gonna show for you guys. If we're getting close, maybe. So you see that grid that I've created? Yep. Right, my stone is going in here, right? So when I hold my stone into that slice, it should just cover up that middle grid, which it pretty much does, right? Mm -hmm. And now I can chart out my piece relative to this. So I'm gonna actually Plonk down my little design into the place that I've got built here. And if I've done it well, I should have a center piece that lines up. And then my divot should fall right on that layout, right? So my divot is covering that all up. Um, I'm going to actually glue this down to that grid that I've made just to give myself a little bit more guidance. For this, I don't need the cyanocrete, it's just holding it down. And take off the alcohol to get that done. 
I mean, take off the uh, blackening. Who knew when we were in elementary school that we'd still be playing with glue sticks at our <laughs> advanced ages? Well, at least we hopefully don't eat them. Right? <laughs> okay, so I'm lining up my center lines and I'm lining up my drop points. So I got that pushed down. Wait a minute. And again, I'm erring on the side of a little bit small for all of my cutaways versus too big. Give that a second to dry. Um, and it's very, very important that we remember we are not cutting either of our cross lines, right? We're gonna we're only cutting our interiors and then our exteriors. And I think that's the order he suggests. Yes, he suggests we do that this inside line first, and then we cut the any exterior work. And then we're gonna cut off the tops in that order. And then, and only then, do we put in the slice, co the connectors between the two. I'm gonna zoom back out so you guys can see me while I'm sawing. And I'm gonna go back to a heavy gauge, um, I'm in a heavy saw blade because I'm going through not one, but two layers of 18 gauge. So I'm gonna go to the largest side that I've got right now. I'm gonna go to a three, not even a three aught, just a straight up three. Let's see how that does. Plenty of wax for this exercise or your preferred lubricant. And I'm going to see how I do. I think I'm probably going to not even wait and see. I'm going to start with um, with my bench clamp, my ring clamp. Rather. Well, I should use John's be doing this right. just to give myself a starting support. Slow and steady on this one. And you're cutting, per John's directions, we're cutting to the inside of the marks we've made, not on the marks, we want to be a little outside of it so that you have that excess room to file. I'm gonna back out at the halfway mark, just because it's going to be a really awkward turn to make otherwise. So when in doubt, pull the saw blade out and start from the other direction. Well, I don't know if anybody else noticed, but uh, Jane Redmond just dropped a cool looking new tool for getting angle cuts. Um, 
that is really designed for working with rotational pieces. I cannot wait to try one. I can't remember the name of it. It just dropped yesterday or the day before. Okay, so we've got our starting framework. Got a little cleanup to do on that. Getting the shape right, which I'm gonna do before I cut my outer edges because it may influence the exact angles and so on that I do. So I'm gonna take, um, in this case, I'm gonna start with, I think I actually have a nicely sized round file that should be big enough to get in there and do some considerable filing. Was it her rotational bench pin? It's uh, is that what it's called? It's the one that that has the spinny option, so that you can add it to her her existing um, angle based. You know the thing that you can do set to an angle. Um, I think so. Complete kit. It says a uh, rotational bench pin. Yeah, with that's mounting plate compatible mount. Yeah, it's it's the new ring part of it. Where is oh. my fancy round file? I think I maybe put some stuff away that I shouldn't have. Um, yeah. So her her rotation. Oh, bench here it is. I found it. Has been around for a while. There we go. That's what. Yeah. It's um, but it's this new add-on she's got. Circle oh. clamp adapter. And yeah. Rotational that, work ring set. Yep, um, that's the one. And it looks intentionally designed for especially doing, um, you know, the plastic uh, die cutting and so on to get every angle possible and turn things around when you need it right in the middle of a cut. Uh-huh. Wow. It's pricey, but it looks... Like, if you're going to do a lot of die cutting, I guess it must it's have. A, yeah, there's a lot of parts here. Yes. Okay, so um, what I'm doing is I can actually see my profile a little bit better from the side that doesn't have everything on it. So now I'm working on cleaning up the look of that profile, remembering that my stone is going to ultimately get this long and skinny put it in the right spot. My stone's going to be sitting right about there, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wide enough and I've got that little angle, but I probably need to sharpen, steepen my angles. Before I get to that, I'm just making sure my view that the stone is going to be resting inside of is looking clean. And then I'm going to switch, scooch over to uh, my favorite barrette file and probably uh, I'm going to use a square or a triangle as well. To do red file, put out already. Oh, well, so just getting my walls pretty cleaned up and equal looking, and then taking those angles that the stone's going to rest on and sharpening them up a little bit. Still, it's super important to keep things parallel. If I make one at a steeper angle than the other, then my stone is going to look tilted inside of the piece. And I'm squaring up right above it.
check with my stone again, make sure I'm not getting too loose. And I get to this point and I can start to see what it's going to set to. So that's got a nice resting pose position. Let me zoom in a little bit for you guys. I picked the orange stone thinking it would show well, but it's apparently just disappearing into the background. Too close. So you can see that my stone is going to fit nicely right in that slot I've made, right? So now I'm feeling like I can work on the outer shaping of the piece, which is to cut my angles on the side. So I'm going to go back to sawing a little bit. I'm going to first do the bottoms because as soon as I hit that top, it's going to be so thin that it's going to just come apart. bit further out than that. In the screen for you guys, back out a little bit. Remember I mentioned, make sure you use a lot of wax. I believe we can make the difference. There goes one saw blade. I think my Kerr saw blade holder may be one of my favorite 3D printed things I've seen for jewelers. Bits of the blade out of there. Yeah, it's pretty smart. Yeah, it is. No, it's not Kerr, is it? Oh, yeah, it's Kerf. K E R F. Yeah. It's really clever. And I like the drill bit version of it too. Okay, once again, I'm going to do the cleanup before I go on to the next cuts, just to make sure that I've got a nice angle going here. Yeah. And you're going to really want to focus on making sure everything is parallel and equal on both sides. So I've got a little bit more steepness on one side than the other. I've got to take a little bit of this corner down. And since they're glued together, it makes it a lot easier to get all this cleanup done. Touching up the, what's going to become the bottom of the setting. Nice thing about doing this on graph paper is I can follow the lines. So we're looking pretty good. Now we've got my stone. Now we're starting to really see the shape of what it's going to become, right? These two are going to flip out and cross each other. So I have one last set of cuts to do to get my top points.
Okay, we got a lot of cleanup on this set because that was a very messy last cut. And they're now technically disconnected from one another. So make sure you're hanging on pretty snugly with whatever you're gripping them in. Yours may not be coming apart at this stage. It's just that I did such a steep point that there's nothing left at the top to hold things. Little pause. Oh. You froze. Oh, now oh. you didn't. You're gone. You're moving now. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm a little off on my points matching up on this one. So I got to take the thicker side down to meet the thinner side. There's enough material that I'm going to move to a bigger file. Remember, always use the largest file you can control for the act you're doing. Because why waste all your energy working out little slices of it if you can take big amounts of material away until you get down to the delicate stuff? Off. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to correct my slight angle issue from the bottom side, not from the top, in order to get this to come in a little cleaner. And even though they're disconnected at this point, I'm trying to do all of my actions at the same time to both halves to keep them in sync. That's making me a little happy. Okay, so we now have two pieces that are reasonably identical. Identical. I can take my paper off at this point, I think. No, actually, I'm going to keep that until I've marked my center lines again. I need to know my exact center. I'm going to remeasure the centers because it may have been gotten off from that little work that I did. So I've now got two things that are equal that are going to be slicing together this way, right? Um, and I, my next step is to do a little cleanup on the edges, and then um, I'm going to put those slices in very, very carefully and with a much thinner cut than you think because all we really need is just barely the thickness of the material in order to slot it past. Questions so far? This is very similar to what we did for the um, cab version of it. We just had to account for that extra piece in the middle in order to get us down um, with, this, with the stone setting down into the cavity that it creates. And we need to leave enough material still that we can connect them together below that. It's great seeing this again. So thanks for going over it. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to try one of the faceted ones. Um, so then our next act is to lay out the slotting. And we are, if you're carrying, if you're following along at home, we're now on page 121. Um and or just the very beginning of uh, do, 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 120 maybe the very end of 120 so what we're what we're about to work on i didn't have to do step nine on page 120 because it came apart when i got to the tops um and so what we're working on next is the fitting for 10 
through 11, 12, right? Um, and so for that, I do still have my mark on one piece, which I'm going to take advantage of and make sure that it is still centered. So it looks like it's a little off kilter. I don't think it actually is centered anymore. But what I care about is what is center of my base. And so I have 4.6, so I'm going to do 2.3 from each side. Just because I have marks that I don't want to confuse myself, I'm I've got it here on the on the opposite side so I can mark it. And it gets tricky because I've done a shape that doesn't have parallel walls. So I'm gonna mark my base point and use my square to create a clean line up the middle. If I can get it to stay where I want it to stay. Yeah, I'm gonna have to hold it up because it's not it's too thin. Starting line, going square, oops, going square. And what I care about is am I making a line straight up the center to the middle of where my stones collect? I basically should be pointing at where the collet is gonna land. So there's one, and then I need to do the same exact thing on the other side. I'm going to get my 2.3. Straight up the middle. Okay, and this is a good one to eyeball, you know, judge, trust your judgment. If it really looks centered, you're in good shape. And then one of them is going to get cut from the bottom and the other is going to get cut from the top. And he recommends we cut which one first? Uh, it looks like the top one first. So whatever we're cutting down from, he wants us to cut this far. And we need to know how far we have to cut it, which should be exactly half of the total uh, length from the start of the of the divot down to the bottom of the piece. So our next measurement is to find center of that. And in this case, center of that will be fresh batteries. 9.33, 9.32, we're going to say. So 4.5, 4.65. Oh man, somebody help me with this math. 9. Point, what did I say? 9.32 divided by 2. What am I doing? by two is four point six six an A four. And I'm gonna go a little bit shy of it just to give myself room to do a filing cleanup if needed, but it should be when I cross from the bottom and when I cross from the top, I should meet in the middle if I've done it right. And I have Again, because we've done these in parallel, I should get the same results on each. That's my stopping point. And I'm gonna draw with Sharpie so you guys can see it. One is gonna go from the bottom and be here. And the other is gonna go from the top and be here. So when we create that cut and that cut, you should have the ability to slot them down into each other. I see you guys seeing that. I need a close up for you, probably. OK, 
Okay, so one we're cutting down from the top and one we're cutting up from the bottom. And then when we put the one that's cut from the bottom slotted, oh, how do I get my fingers out of your way? When we slot them together, this one will slot down onto that one. Okay, so we're gonna start with the top one and we want to make our cut no thicker than, and probably ever so slightly thinner than, whatever gauge metal we're working with. So in this case, we need one millimeter, less than one millimeter, but I'm gonna go with one millimeter, probably just as a marker down the center. Oh, conveniently, the meat, what I need is about the width of my um, Sharpie mark. So I'm gonna start by cutting straight down the middle. Except I'm gonna put this in a grip because this is tiny. I'd like to have some control. Zoom back out for you guys. Again, stop just before your actual end mark to give yourself a little leeway to file. And you're going to be using your saw as a file in this context because you really need barely a saw blade width, maybe a little bit more than that before you get to your outer limits as we want as snug a fit between these two as we can. So I'm essentially just doing multiple little cuts down my center line trying to take a little bit more away with each pass. And if you have one, for this particular step task, if you have a teeny tiny um, hinge file, also called a chenier file, or chenier, if you're reading it, um, that's a handy file to have for this. So all I've done is put that itty bitty little cut in there. And I'm going to do just that much on the other one, going from the other direction. And then we're going to start to fit them. Again, focusing on straight down the center. Probably just before I get to the meat point, using the saw as a file to widen it out a little bit. Sometimes I find I have to come inside of the piece and cut back out to get a nice clean opening there. And think of it more as a file than a saw at this point. A, a skinny, a little um, barrette file as I can find, or if I have one that's really thin, I'll use the... Uh, the hinge file. I don't know where my tiny hinge file is. Oh, maybe there's my tiny hinge file. No, nope, not the hinge file. What are my options? Did? Probably a little too wide already. I gotta check it and see. very, very close to what I need. I can already start to slot them together. I just need to clean it up a little bit, which entirely means finding the right file for the job.
making this too wide already. Nope, that's actually looking about what I need it to be. Something to grip this with. So back into the clamp. None of these are exactly the size I'm looking for. So I got in here. Oh, there's my hinge oil. Yeah, that's what I needed. Hey, tiny files don't file quickly. Before I go much further. Starting to get to that magical connects together point. Okay, it's starting to get there. I got to get a little bit more clean up on these lines, but that is a snug fit. And by the way, while we're here, I want to pause and appreciate this as a conceptual shape for a pair of earrings or something. This this class, I mean, this style of connecting things is really interesting for other kinds of work. It doesn't have to just result in um, a card cut setting, right? It's not a neat shape. I could do something with a chain of those. Probably a little less pokey on the ends. Yeah, it's cool. So don't forget this concept of the slotting for other things. Yep, I just need to grip them when they're this tiny. Oh, so close. Go a smidge further. On uh, which one do I need to go further? Oops, that's the club one. Oh, oh, oh. 
So by the time we're done, both of these slots should be the same size. Oh, so I need to do a little more on each of them. Undercut by a little too much. Next. Oh, so freaking close, gang. So close. Yay. There we go. Okay. So, where's our stone? There's our stone. In theory, this stone will fit down inside of there. Right now, it's probably got to get a little bit of stuff pushed out of the way. Well, maybe not. Yeah, I need to do a little smidge of cleanup, but we're getting there. Let me zoom in on that for you guys so you can see. Wow. Yeah, this is a cool little shape, isn't it? Yeah. Focus. Wow. Right? Yep. It's kind of Star Trekian. Um, so very, very snug fit on the pinch you can see that i've just got it connected there and honestly i would do a lot of edge cleanup and so on i'd probably burnish it down with some gray star or something like that or another cutting compound before i go and do the solder but for the sake of our demo today to get us through it i'm going to go solder this real quick Oop, wrong bench there we go and john has us soldering these upside down Locks it up. So I remember that when we did the other version of this with the um, uh, cabochon, that uh, I did not get as snug a fit. I'm really pleased with the snugness of this fit because um, it makes a huge difference in keeping the perpendicular fit of things. Um, if you do decide to get fancy and go with um, a stone that has more, you know, that you need to do like three angles. You're doing a six prong or something like that. You're going to have to account for that in the angles so they won't be square angles cutting perpendicular to each other. You're going to have to account for the diagonal of them fitting together. So it becomes epically more challenging. I'm using hard solder with my horribly messy pick. Man, I need to clean these. I'm just putting it some up at the top there. I'm going to try and flow it down all the way. Everything. Like a bunny. When it's that snug of a fit, you know, a little bit more solder than that. When it's that snug of a fit, though, it's a pretty straight shot to get the solder flow. It's not going all the way down yet, so I'm going to put a little bit more still. Oh, that's what I was looking for. 
and Bamo. We have a setting. All right, so I'm gonna uh, put that in the pickle and I'll come over and chat with you guys and see what questions you have. Any questions on that process, gang? Oop, did Carmen get back in? Ah, uh, shoot, I didn't see her message to me. I'm hoping, oh, yes, Carmen's back, good. Carmen, sorry, I didn't see your note when you popped it up originally. Any questions out there, gang, at all? Too, but I I'm getting a few words from you, Carmen. Are you there? It's not a good internet day for me. Yeah. I'm just going to re-see it on Zoom. On, okay. I mean, on, on YouTube. YouTube. Okay, I'm hearing you pretty well now. So if you have but, a question or you can type it in because I did get the the posted question. I just wasn't at the machine to see it. Um, anybody else have questions on that sequence that we just went through? Okay, so um, I think given the time, uh, what I'm going to do is I will polish that one up because it's a quick set once we get back next session. So the, the December session will consist of setting that setting we just did, which should be a matter of minutes, carefully setting our magical um, uh, uh, finally done properly um, emerald cut. And um, and then we'll sit and chat. We'll have bring your favorite beverage and holiday cheer and eggnog and whatever is your preferred beverage. Um, and we'll talk about any of the settings that we need to, and I'll have the board out. And otherwise, it'll just be a nice wrap to two years, two years of doing John Codswell's book, his amazing book. And I did drop him a note of thanks. Um, I have not heard back from him, which has me a little concerned. Um, I'm hoping he's doing okay. Um, but he's not a big emailer, no matter what. So um, those of you that sent me pictures, he got some of your pictures and he put together a note about how much it meant to all of us to have gone through this. So hopefully he managed to get that. Um, anybody have show and tell for me this week? And anything at all? Nothing. It doesn't have to be these settings. Remember, I like to see what you're working on. Okay. I, I guess. Question if you can oh, hear me. I can. Yep. What do you got? Well, I could hear you when you asked if I could hear you. Nope, you're coming and going. Can you put it into can chat? You see me? Nope. You're I just a black screen. Um, is your video actually activated? Oop, that's not who I meant to spotlight. Sorry about that, Paul. Let me switch to. Okay. No, it's not even letting me spotlight. Oh, and did she just drop? So Carmen, it doesn't seem like it's working no. today. Carmen, I think we're not getting you on screen, so it may have to wait okay. for next time. Okay. Sorry. Anybody else have something that they want to ask about or something that they want to show? Oh, now you're there. We see you now, Carmen. but you're frozen. I think we have to give up on trying to get it working. All right, I'm not hearing anything else. I'm, I want to I wanna say, please bring whatever you're working on at your bench next session. I don't care whether it has stone setting in it or not. I don't get to see enough of other people's work when we're doing these. 
Um, so bring whatever you're, or, or something that you've made in the past that you're proud of or anything, wear your bling, wear your bling to December's session. Um, and uh, those of you that I'm going to see this weekend on the clasps class, I will see you in a couple days. I'm looking forward to that one. It's always a fun class. Um, and those of you that aren't signed up, if you suddenly go, I want to take the class class, you can still sign up. It's not too late. We start Friday. So you got to sign up before that, probably Thursday night. Um, and then I am not yet sure of next year's class schedule. I've got to look at my show schedule, which is a little weird next year, um, before I can layer in the class, uh, schedule other than that one Holoforms class out in Los Angeles area. Um, I am going to try and teach another one for Metalworks if they'll have me once I get them my proposals. I just didn't get to it this year. And uh, otherwise, I don't know whether I'll do other in-person classes or not, but I'll probably do one or two more um, video classes. So I guess that's it for this evening, gang. Have a lovely week if I don't see you, or month even, and holidays if you celebrate Thanksgiving-y stuff. Uh, and I'll see you just before Christmas. I'll see you Friday. Thank <laughs> right. you. Bye, all. Bye. Bye.